This is a quotation I saw in medical school um, by Thomas Edison. It said, the doctor of the future will give no medicine, but instead will interest his patient in the care of the human frame, in diet, and in the cause and prevention of disease. And one of Thomas's writer ideas. And when I saw this quote in medical school, I just passed it right on by. <clears throat> I, was, I went to the University of Illinois College of Medicine in Chicago, and I was so into becoming a real doctor, who, and real doctors do real doctor things. They deliver babies, they fix broken arms, they sew up lacerations, that's what real doctors do. And diet was boring stuff, and nutrition, yeah. You send them down to the, dietet the dietitian, and they figure out a 2,000 calorie diet, and don't bother me. And that's how I practiced medicine for the first eight or 10 years of my career. Well, I have soon, or I have late, uh, come to realize how important what we eat really is in the creation and prevention of so many of the diseases that we see today. And I'll tell you how I came to those realizations. Now, the North American diet has changed. This is not going to be a technical lecture, but I did want to show you this one graph because there are some very significant lines here. The two top lines, the lavender line and the yellow line, are the amount of plant-based foods that are consumed in the United States and in Canada as well. And this is back in 1909. You can see we were eating a lot of grain products. We were eating almost 300 pounds of, um, of wheat and barley and other grain products and almost 200 pounds of potatoes a year. Look what happened in the intervening 85 years. Our consumption of, of uh, wheat and grain products have fallen to half of their 1909 level, and our potato consumption has fallen to half of their 1909 level. Look what happened to the amount of flesh foods that we are eating. The amount of milk we consume has more than doubled, our beef consumption has gone up by 50 percent, and our chicken consumption has gone up by 280 percent. We are eating a tremendous amount of animal flesh, and we have essentially exchanged a plant-based diet for a meat-based diet. And the results have been just disastrous for both our health and the environment. Consider how much animal flesh uh, most North Americans eat. In their lifetime, the average meat-eating American is going to eat 15 cows, oh, <laughs> going to eat 24 hogs, eat 12 sheep. She will eat 900 chickens and 1,000 pounds of assorted animals that either swam in the water or flew in the air. That is a tremendous amount of animal flesh to be pouring through the human bloodstream year after year. No wonder we wind up with clogged arteries and high blood pressure and cancers and a lot of other diseases, and I'll show you how those two are related. Let's talk about the health effects of an animal-based diet. Here it is, the great American dietary catastrophe in all its glory. I grew up thinking this is good food. What's for lunch, Mom? Oh, I got something good for you, son, she'd say. And she would give me some food like this. And my mother didn't know, and your mother didn't know. Uh, they didn't know that the uh, sausages and the eggs and the ham were just loaded with fat and cholesterol. And this is a coronary artery thrombosis waiting for some place to happen. Now, what is the effect on your body when you eat food like this? Well, the effect was brought out very dramatically uh, to me about 10 years ago. I was on the cardiovascular anesthesia service. That's the service that deals with people's hearts and blood vessels. And like all good anesthesia residents, I was making my rounds one evening to see my patients for next morning surgery. And the last patient I was seeing, I pulled back the curtain and there was Mr. Phillips. Nice fella, but he was just huge. He weighed 290 pounds and he was booked for a four-vessel coronary artery bypass procedure. Um, he weighed 290 pounds, 290 was also his systolic blood pressure, it was also his cholesterol level, it was also his blood sugar level. I call him Mr. 290, nice guy, uh, but really clogged up in his arteries. And because it was late at night, it was too late to call the blood drawing technician up to draw his blood test, I drew his, his preoperative blood work into a glass tube and I put it out at the nurse's station, and later I came by to pick up the blood tube and take it down to the laboratory. And when I looked at the tube of blood, I couldn't believe my eyes. When you draw blood into a glass tube and let it sit there for an hour, it separates out into two parts, and the red clot settles to the bottom, and the liquid part of the blood, the serum, rises up to the top. Here you see two tubes of blood, and the tube on the left is normal, serum, is normal blood. Here you see the dark red clot, and this golden yellow liquid, this is normal serum. This is what your blood is supposed to look like. But I looked at Mr. Phillips' tube, and it was just shocking. 
The serum floating in his tube was thick and greasy white. It looked like Elmer's glue. It stuck to the sides of the tube when I shook it. I went back into the room. I said, Mr. Phillips, did you eat before you came to the hospital? He said, yes. I said, what did you have? He said, I had a double cheeseburger and a milkshake. And when he said that, I realized what I was looking at was all the fat in the beef burger and the butter fat and the cheese and the butter fat and the ice cream and the butter fat and the milk had oozed out into his blood and turned his blood fat. It's a well-known clinical phenomenon. It's called lipemia, and it happens every time you eat a fatty meal, you turn your blood fatty, and your blood stays this way for four hours until your liver can clear it out of the bloodstream. If you are like most North Americans and eat bacon and eggs for breakfast and a cheeseburger for lunch and fried chicken for dinner and ice cream for dessert, you're keeping your blood fatty all day. The stuff never clears out of the bloodstream. You keep your blood fatty for 40 years, 50 years, 60 years. What do you think is going to happen to the arteries carrying all that fat? I will show you what happens to the arteries carrying all that fat in a few minutes. But it's a disaster. There's a lot of fat in the North American diet, and it's hidden in most foods. You can see the fat around a T-bone steak, but most of the fat is in the muscle of the animal, and it's hidden in the dairy products. And and uh, most of the folks who present food to us don't want us to think about the fat, especially the fast food industry. They really don't want you to think about how much fat is in their burgers and hot dogs, uh, except one chain of fast food restaurants in Los Angeles. There is one burger chain that is very forthright about the reality of the fat content of their diet, and they come right out and tell you, uh, clearly on their marquee, um, about, uh, about the product that they're selling. Now, if you stood outside the exit door of this restaurant or McDonald's or any other fast food restaurant where people are shoveling in their cheeseburgers, if you stood at the exit door with a needle and a syringe in your hand and drew blood on the people walking out the exit door, what you would see is most of the blood would be as fatty as Mr. Phillips' blood tube. Now, they're all in there making the blood fatty. If you ever have a big cheese pizza and a bowl of ice cream afterwards and you feel a little greasy on the inside, it's because you really are. You really, you really go greasy on the inside. Animal fat comes in three flavors in the North American diet. It comes in the form of red meat, and the fat is in the meat. It is in the fibers of the animal's muscle, and just trimming off the white fat around the edge of the steak really does not lower the fat and cholesterol content significantly of the meat. So red meat is the number one source of fat and cholesterol in the North American diet. The second is the yolk of hen's eggs. The egg of a chicken is meant to hatch baby chicks. And it, the yolk of the hen's egg is one of the most concentrated globs of fat and cholesterol on the planet. It is made to power that baby chicken for 21 days with no other energy. And when you run egg yolks through your bloodstream, you turn your blood fatty, just like Mr. Phillips. And the third source of fat in the North American diet comes from that white fluid that comes out of the udder of a cow. Now, cow's milk is a high-fat fluid exquisitely designed for turning a 65-pound calf into a 400-pound cow in a year. That is what cow's milk is for. Now, the it's a, it, whole milk has a butterfat content of 3%. That's the cream that rises up to the top. And you eat, you drink a, a 3% solution of butterfat, you're going to turn your blood fatty, as will a 2 and 1% solution of butterfat. But at the dairy, the butter fat is skimmed off and they concentrate it into huge vats, half the size of this room. And they concentrate the fat to 50, 60, 80, 90 percent fat. This stuff is so thick you can walk across it. Why do they do that? Well, they do that so you will buy it and eat it. Uh, the butter fat is mixed up with uh, air until it hardens into chunks called butter. The butter fat is uh, mixed with sugar and frozen and sold as ice cream. The butter fat is mixed up with cocoa powder and uh, sugar and sold as milk chocolate. The butter fat is mixed up with bacteria and allowed to ferment until it turns into sour cream. A lower fat version is called yogurt. And the butter fat is mixed up with calf stomach and, uh, and bacteria and allowed to ferment for about six weeks till it hardens into chunks called cheese. These are all forms of butter fat. The folks at the dairy want you to buy the butter fat and eat it. And when you do, you turn your blood fat. There's absolutely no reason to run butter fat through your bloodstream at any time, and I'm submitting to you that you'll be a lot healthier and happier if you do not. Cow's milk is for baby calves. You have no more need of cow's milk than you knew giraffe milk or horse milk or rat milk. <laughs> now back to Mr. Phillips. Nice fella, but I was impressed with all the fat in his bloodstream. We took Mr. Phillips down to the operating room, and I gave him a thousand micrograms of fentanyl and put him to sleep, and the surgeon opened up his chest and opened up his aorta and opened up his coronary arteries. 
And what, he, what the surgeon started pulling out of Mr. Phillips' arteries were great, long, yellow, greasy, sausage-like uh, formations of fat that look like this. What you're looking at is a plug of material called atherosclerosis. And this is the plug of fat that built up in a man's arteries. The artery uh, was a tube coming out at you from the screen. The artery wall has been cut away, and you're just looking at the fat that built up. It started around the edge of the blood vessel and started moving in on the blood flow channel as the years went by. And the blood flow channel got smaller and smaller and smaller till only this dark red spot was left for the blood flow to come through. And when a clot formed here, it stopped the blood flow completely through that artery. And because it happened this, in this man's right coronary artery, it stopped the blood flow to his heart and bought him a ticket to the autopsy table. This is the number one cause of death of people in North America. Every 30 seconds on this continent, Canada included, somebody grabs their chest and falls over with a heart attack. This is animal fat clogging up the arteries. When you send this material down to the pathologist and you ask him to analyze it, the report always comes back the same. Saturated fat and cholesterol. It's animal fat. The pathology report never, ever, ever contains the words remnants of broccoli, rice, and tofu <laughs> as animal fat. The good news is when you stop running animal fat through your bloodstream, this stuff melts away. This stuff will come off the artery walls and arteries can open up. And Dr. Dean Ornish in California and Dr. John McDougall and a number of other physicians are now routinely reversing atherosclerosis, having people cancel their coronary artery bypass surgery because they've changed their diet and their arteries have opened up. That's the good news. Here is the process happening. Here are six arteries coming out at you from the screen. The dark red circle is the artery wall. Um, the pink material is the atherosclerotic material uh, clogging the artery. The white spot is the blood flow channel, which is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Any organ dependent upon this blood vessel for its blood flow is in trouble. Fortunately, it's a reversible disease. This atherosclerotic material clogs arteries all over the body. It's just a matter of which artery to which organ clogs up first that gives you the symptoms. If the yellow atherosclerotic fat builds up in an artery going up to the brain, you will suffer a stroke. If it clogs an artery going to your kidney, you'll suffer kidney failure or high blood pressure. If the atherosclerotic material accumulates on the walls of large blood vessels like the aorta that takes blood from the heart down to the abdomen and legs, the artery walls become damaged and weakened. They lose their strength. And the high pressure in the blood vessel causes the artery to balloon out, forming an aneurysm, which can then rupture, leading to emergency surgery or death. If the yellow atherosclerotic material clogs up an artery going to a loop of intestine, the general surgeon will open your abdomen and remove that loop of bowel. If the atherosclerotic material clogs up an artery going to a toe or foot, you will watch that toe or foot turn dark and gangrenous, and you'll sign permission forms for amputation. And if the atherosclerotic material clogs an artery going to the heart, you will suffer crushing chest pain when you walk, called angina pectoris. Or if it clogs the blood flow completely and damages the heart muscle, that is a heart attack. People, this is all the same disease. We are talking about animal fat, essentially clogging up the arteries throughout the body. And it's the number one cause of death and disability in North America. And this is essentially a disease of people who eat animals and the products made from animals. You almost never see these diseases in pure vegetarians. And William Castelli, the doctor who runs the Framingham Heart Study, says he has never seen a heart attack in anybody with a cholesterol below 150. And there's good reason for that. Why does this happen? Because all fats are not created equal. There is a fundamental difference between animal fats and plant oils. Animal fats contain cholesterol. No plant food contains cholesterol in any significant amount. It is an animal product. And very importantly, animal fats are highly saturated. They've got lots of hydrogen atoms hanging on them. And that makes animal fats very stiff. In fact, animal fats are solid at body temperature. If you're in a kitchen on a summer day and you've got a piece of T-bone steak on the counter and it's 98.6 degrees out, the same as your body temperature, the fat on that beef steak is solid. It's, it's a nice white chunk sitting there. If you have a bottle of olive oil on the same table at that same temperature, it's liquid at that same body temperature. I don't know about you, but I don't want to eat any fat that is solid at my body temperature because it's going to start clogging up my arteries. And that's the beauty of plant oils. They're liquid at your body temperature. They really don't cling to your arteries. Animal fats contain a substance called arachidonic acid. And arachidonic acid stimulates the creation in the body of a substance called prostaglandin 2. 
And prostaglandin sets off lots of inflammatory reactions in the body that can irritate the blood vessels, perhaps contributing to atherosclerosis. It may well uh, cause a lot of inflammatory reactions in the joints, the skin, the bronchial membranes, and other places. Plant oils have a substance called linoleic acid, and that gives rise to substances called prostaglandin 1 and 3, and these are natural anti-inflammatories. They soothe inflammation in the body. So people who are on more vegetarian diets have much less problem with inflammatory diseases. Fundamental difference. You have no need to take animal fats into your bodies at all, and I really suggest you meet all your, your fat needs. And we need about 50 grams of fat a day. Get it from plant oils. You find it in grains have, have oils, uh, legumes have oils, nuts, seeds. There's lots of oils available in the plant kingdom. That's where you should meet your oil needs, not from the fat of animals. The other thing about fats is make you fat. Animal fats stick to you. When you eat fats of animals, those fats wash through your bloodstream, and as they cross the, um, as they flow through your fat stores under your skin, they stick there. You've got fat cells looking for pre-made fats, and you eat the fat of animals, they stick there. What you see hanging on this man's abdomen really isn't even his fat. That is the fat of all the cows and pigs and chickens and ducks and turkeys and other slow animals that were walking past his table when he had a fork in his hand. <laughs> Not his fat. The good news is, if he changes his diet and starts eating rice and vegetables and, uh, and good plant-based foods, this stuff melts away, and people get leaner. It certainly happened to me. Remember the old nursery rhyme of Jack Spratt, who could eat no fat, his wife could eat no lean? You always see Jack portrayed as a lean fellow because he ate no animal fats. Mrs. Spratt's always seen sitting down. She has a hard time getting up, her knees hurt her, her blood pressure goes up, her diabetes gets out of control, so she should be sitting down. The lesson of Jack Spratt was certainly not lost on me because back in the operating room in Vancouver, here I was, and now I'm the anesthetist, and I'm standing at the head of the table looking down into the surgical wound, and I'm seeing all this fat in these people's arteries, and I did most of my growing up on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. I've been milking cows since I was six and driving tractors since I was eight, and not only was Mr. Phillips eating all these animals, but so was Dr. Clapper. And I was eating cheese and chickens and various other slow animals, and I was uh, getting concerned. Not only should my patients not run all that fat to their bloodstream, but this old doc shouldn't either. So I said to myself, self, if you don't have to run all this fat to your bloodstream, must you? What is the nutrients in meats and dairy products that if you don't eat them, you're going to be deficient of? So I opened up my books on biochemistry and physiology and nutrition, and guess what I found? There is absolutely no nutrient, no protein, no vitamin, no mineral, no nothing found in meats and dairy products that you cannot obtain on a plant-based foods. Consider the biggest animals on the planet, elephants and buffaloes and giraffes. These are vegetarian animals. They grow to thousands of pounds of muscle and bone without ever eating cheeseburgers and pepperoni pizzas. We can do the same. We can certainly uh, build our 140 pounds or whatever it is you need to build in your body. The human body has absolutely no nutritional requirements for animal flesh. If you open up Harrison's textbook of internal medicine, you will find no disease listed acute cow flesh deficiency. And there is no chronic chicken flesh deficiency. There is no such disease because we have no need for these substances whatsoever. Animal fats, they clog you up and they make you fat. Two good reasons not to eat them. Here's a couple of more. It seems to be fairly clear as study after study comes out that if you are eating large amounts of fats in your diet, you are significantly raising your risk for cancer. If you are a woman eating a lot of fat in your diet, and that's talking about the hidden fat and cheeses and meats, etc., you increase your risk of cancer of the breast. Here are some countries that are compared by how much fat is eaten versus how many women die of breast cancer. And you can see that the Americans and the Dutch, with their big dairy industries, lead the way in not only fat consumption, they lead the way in breast cancer deaths. Thailand is a Buddhist country. They eat very little meat and dairy products, and breast cancers are so rare there, if you find a case of it, you report it at Grand Rounds. This seems to be a disease of diet, of a high-fat diet. If I were a woman with breast and I wanted to decrease my chances of getting breast cancer, I would get the fat out of my diet. And that includes excessive amounts of vegetable oil. You need a little bit of vegetable oil, but you don't want to slather two cups of corn oil over your spaghetti for any reason. Men are not spared the ravages of a high-fat diet either, because when a man eats lots of animal fats, those fats are turned into male hormones called androgens. And androgens stimulate the prostate gland to get big. 
In our society, when a man reaches 60 or 70 and his prostate gland gets big, his doctor puts his arm around the patient and says, well, George, that's just part of getting old, your prostate gland's getting big. No, it's not. That's 70 years of running androgen through that prostate gland. No wonder that gland gets big, and prostate cancer is the number one killer of, can of men. And if you compare countries of the world versus how much fat is eaten and how much men die of prostate cancer sorts out just the same way. The more fat that is eaten in a country, the more the men die of prostate cancer. And again, it's a very rare disease in Thailand where people eat rice and vegetables and traditional foods. So, animal fats. They clog you up, they make you fat, and they increase your risk for a number of types of cancers. There's uh, three good reasons not to eat animal fats, and as I said, there's absolutely no reason to eat them ever. Now, I'm describing problems with eating animal flesh. They have too much fat, and that includes chicken and fish. Uh, fish has a tremendous amount of fat and cholesterol in it, and chicken flesh is very fatty food. If you ever watch your mother make chicken soup, you ever see all that fat that rises up to the top there? Uh, don't kid yourself that chicken is lean meat. It is not. There's just as much fat and cholesterol in chicken as there is in beef. Animal muscle is animal muscle. And when you eat it, it raises the level of fat in your blood, and you do not need it. There's another problem with eating animal flesh. It has too much protein. Now, when I was in medical school, I never heard the words too much protein. I thought the more protein, the better. Put them on a high-protein diet, make them strong. Taint so. You better believe there's such a thing called too much protein, and most North Americans suffer from it. First of all, what is protein? Protein is the building block material that you use to make the hard structures of your body. Your fingernails are made of protein, your hair is made of protein, your bones are made of protein. It's the brick of our body. It's a solid substance. Now, you don't need very much protein during the day. You only need about 30 grams of protein a day. That's the weight of 10 pennies, okay? Imagine 10 pennies in your hand, that's how much protein you need. But look how much protein the typical North American consumes. <clears throat> On a typical North American eating day, a typical American who has bacon and eggs for breakfast and a glass of milk, who has a cheeseburger and milkshake lunch, and has a beefsteak dinner with a glass of milk and some ice cream for dessert, is clipping along at 150 grams of protein. That is a five-day supply of protein. That is too much protein. Why? Because your body can't store protein. You can store fats, you can store carbohydrates, you can't store protein. So what happens? Well, your liver starts breaking down that protein, and as it metabolizes it, it releases all sorts of, of toxic nitrogen-containing wastes like urea and ammonia and amino acid fragments. And these have a detrimental effect on the body because as all these amino acid wastes go through your kidneys, it makes you lose calcium out of your urine. Why does that happen? Because there's fundamental differences between animal protein and plant protein. And I'm talking about the protein in meats and dairy products. Animal proteins contains amino acids that have sulfur, and sulfur makes extra acid in the body. And as acids wash through the bone, they dissolve calcium out of the bones. Plants have much less acid. Animal protein is very concentrated. The muscle of an animal is the most concentrated protein on the planet. And so there's a big bolt of protein that goes into your bloodstream as soon as you eat it. Plant protein is mixed up with fiber. When you eat whole grain rice or whole grain um, uh, barley, it takes hours for that to be absorbed into your bloodstream. The absorption time is much, much slower. So the less acid nature of plant protein and its slower absorption rate means it's much gentler in the body and it doesn't pull calcium out of your body. That's a very significant phenomenon. The phenomenon of protein pulling calcium out of your body is appropriately called protein-induced, protein-induced, hypercalciuria, too much calcium going out in the urine. What I'm saying is, and it's well documented, when you eat a big bolt of animal protein, whether it be red meat or chicken or fish or even milk, the acid nature of the protein washes through the bones, dissolves the calcium, which then goes out in the urine. And what I'm telling you is that every time you eat a piece of chicken, and every time you eat a piece of fish, ladies, for the next three or four hours, you urinate calcium out of your body down the toilet. And the investigators who've documented this many times clearly say that high protein diets cause a negative calcium balance, even in the presence of more than adequate dietary calcium, even if you are taking calcium tablets and drinking milk, Protein is such a potent yanker outer of calcium out of your body that you will not be able to keep up with the calcium loss. Does that ring a bell with anybody? It did with the investigators. They said that osteoporosis, thin crumbly bones that fracture easily, 
would seem to be an inevitable outcome of continued consumption of a high protein diet. In our society, we are told that the cause of osteoporosis is not chewing up enough calcium tablets or not drinking enough cow's milk. And you're really, thought to, you're really told to believe this. There's a lot of medical evidence that says this just is not so. And this was clearly shown, I feel, in a study that was released by Cornell University recently, done by Dr. Colin Campbell, where they investigated thousands of people in the Republic of China. And they found that in this country, essentially osteoporosis is, is unheard of. They don't get osteoporosis. And women make it into their 80s, having nursed five children, and they have nice, strong bones. And yet here is a country that consumes essentially no dairy products. The milk isn't available, the cows aren't available, the refrigeration isn't available. They get all their calcium out of grains and greens and fruits and vegetables, and they don't get osteoporosis because they are eating grains and vegetables, and it doesn't make them urinate out their calcium. But it's been clearly shown as the Chinese folks move to the cities, get more affluent, and start eating more meat in their diet, they start losing calcium, and then the osteoporosis appears. It's really becoming apparent that osteoporosis seems to be not so much a disease of calcium deficiency, it's a disease of protein excess. You see osteoporosis in the countries that consume the most protein, in the United States, in Scandinavia, in Europe, and in Australia. That's where you see osteoporosis. You don't see it in China, you don't see it in rural South America, you don't see it in rural Asia, where people are eating grains and vegetables. And I'll tell you, dairy products are no protection against osteoporosis because the Americans and the Canadians and the Scandinavians are the people who drink more milk and eat more cheese than anybody else on planet Earth, and they have the worst osteoporosis on the planet. And if dairy, protein, if dairy products protected you from osteoporosis, you wouldn't see it in North America. And you see just the opposite, because there's so much protein in dairy products that it actually puts you in negative calcium balance, makes you urinate out your calcium. And Dr. Recker's study clearly showed this. They gave women three eight-ounce glasses of milk a day for a year, and they were still in negative calcium balance because there's so much protein in milk. Don't rely on dairy products for your, for your calcium. Get it out of grains and greens and fruits and vegetables, but most important, hold on to your calcium by getting all that chicken and fish flesh out of your kidneys and out of your body and out of your bones. There's been studies uh, comparing the bone density of vegetarian women versus meat-eating women, and clearly the vegetarian ladies hold on to their calcium better than the meat-eating women because they're not eating all that protein. The third problem with the North American diet, outside of having too much fat and too much protein, is that it has very little fiber in it. Plant fiber are the starches and sugars in uh, plant foods that are not absorbed out of the intestine into the bloodstream. They stay in the intestine. Uh, they pass through the intestine, these plant fibers draw water into the intestine, they make for a nice soft uh, fecal material, uh, makes for a nice normal bowel function. And very importantly, when meat is eaten, and the meat gets down to the colon, the large intestine, the bacteria in the, uh, in the large intestine break down the meat uh, proteins and the bile acids that the liver secretes to digest them, breaks these substances down into cancer-causing substances, into carcinogens called benzopyrene and nitrosamine. And you smear these cancer-causing substances on the inside of your colon for 50 years, 60 years. What do you think is going to set off in there? President Reagan found out the hard way, as 60,000 North Americans do every year. They opened up his colon and found a big fungating cancer of the colon. This is essentially a disease of meat-eating people. You very rarely see this in vegetarian people because they're not smearing all that meat protein on the inside of their colon. Another good reason to consider eliminating animal products from your diet. You will substantially lower your risk of cancer of the colon. Numerous studies have now shown that. Why does all this happen? Good heavens, what a set of catastrophes to fall on you just because you want a cheeseburger for lunch. That doesn't seem fair, does it? Well, uh, to me, it seems pretty logical because our digestive system simply is not that of a mountain lion. We are not carnivores, no matter how you look at it. In fact, if you compare the digestive system of man to a mountain lion and that of a true herbivore like a horse, you find we are far more like the herbivore than the carnivore. If you look at the mountain lion, you'll see that the jaw joint is an up and down vertical hinge. Uh, jaws of your house cat and mountain lions open up and down like a trap door. They cannot chew from side to side if they wanted to because their jaw joint won't permit it. Horses, an antelope on the other hand, have nice sliding jaw joints that permit them to chew in a rotary motion. And that works very nicely with their flat grinding molar teeth in the back of their lower jaw, which allows them to grind up grains and greens and grasses. That is exactly the same arrangement that you and I have. We have nice sliding jaw joints and flat grinding molar teeth. 
The back teeth of your house cat or a mountain lion are overlapping shearing fangs for tearing the flesh. We really don't have carnivorous teeth. The stomach acid of a mountain lion is 20 times more concentrated than that of either a horse or a man because mountain lions are digesting flesh, which is protein that needs a lot of acid. These animals are digesting carbohydrates that require a lot less acid to digest. And finally, the mark of the intestine is a very key differentiating point. Whoever designed the mountain lion seemed to know again that when meat sits in the colon, it breaks down into carcinogens. And those cats do not want that meat sitting in the bowel for very long. And on, on a mountain lion, the intestine is 12 feet and out. It's time to move that stuff right out. The, that's a mark of a carnivore. The herbivores have the opposite situation. Horses and antelopes and gazelles are chewing up plant fiber all day. Their enzymes need a long time to break down all the plant fiber. So it's in the herbivore's interest to have a great long intestine. Herbivores do, and so do we. If you were the size of a horse, your intestines would be one and a half times the length of a horse's intestine. We have great long and vigorous intestines, not very much acid in the stomach, flat grinding molar teeth, and sliding jaw joints. We are way more designed like an herbivore than a carnivore. Now, I'm not saying we are complete herbivores, and we do have the ability to digest small amounts of meat, I believe, as an emergency ration uh, to get us through times of, fa of famine. But if you eat a diet of all meat, like a mountain lion, you'll die. If you eat a diet of all vegetable products, you'll thrive, and it's been shown throughout history. Now, when I make these comparisons, inevitably, somebody points to their canine teeth in their upper jaw, and they say, aha, what about these? Why were we given sharp teeth like this if we weren't supposed to be eating meat? To that, I can only reply that these canine teeth in our upper jaw work very well for biting into apples and bananas and potatoes, but they really aren't carnivorous teeth. If you want to see what a set of real carnivorous teeth look like, here they are. Now, if your teeth look like this, you can walk into McDonald's, order three Big Macs, say, don't bother to cook them, I'll take them just like they are. Uh, but seriously, if you look at the canine teeth on this big cat, uh, compared to the central incisors, you'll see the canines are much longer than the central incisors. If you look in the mirror at your own teeth, you'll find that your canines are shorter than your central incisors. They just don't work well for biting through flesh. And if you think they do, run this little thought experiment. Imagine running out to the nearest cow you see, jump on its back, open your mouth, and take a big bite out of its backside. Now what are you gonna find? You're gonna find that your mouth is very small, and that your teeth are very short, and that you can't bite through that animal's hide, let alone its muscle, and you're going to get bounced off that cow and walk away very hungry. So the effects of an animal-based diet on the human digestive system and the human body has just been disastrous. It has led to an epidemic of clogged arteries, of obesity, of cancer of the colon and the, pres pro the breast and the prostate gland, drains calcium out of our bone and gives us high blood pressure, and fats on the body soak up insulin, and insulin is what you need to burn up your blood sugar, and people who are obese frequently uh, have adult onset diabetes, and they can't handle their blood sugar. As people get leaner, their fat stores go down, that frees up their insulin, and many patients in my practice have had their diabetes go away because they get nice and lean and they've got plenty of insulin that works. And this has been my experience in my medical practice. When I saw Mr. Phillips and all that fat in his blood, and I decided to change my diet, wonderful things happened. I learned how to make a couple of good breakfasts and lunches and dinners. And I took a walk every day, and something remarkable happened in my body. First of all, most clearly, a 20-pound spare tire of fat around my waist, which I couldn't shake, even though I was running five miles a day. That spare tire in six weeks just melted right away, and I started waking up in a nice, lean, light body, and it felt great. My cholesterol level dropped down from 220 down to 140. My blood pressure, which had been 150 over 90, dropped down to 110, 70, and it felt wonderful waking up in a nice, lean, light body every day. Well, with that, I knew that there was not only a change in my life, but there was a change in my medical career happening because there I was learning to be an anesthesiologist. And I was literally spending my day putting people to sleep. And I felt that if I wanted to be a good physician and keep people out of hospitals, it was time to help them wake up. <laughs> so I had six months left in my residency, but I went to the head of anesthesia and said, sir, as much as I enjoy anesthesia, I'm going back to general practice. And I did. And I moved down to Florida, and I opened up a little clinic. But this time I was smart. In the clinic, I put in a little kitchen because you just can't tell what people not to eat. You gotta say, here's what you eat. And I had a vegetarian chef come in and we showed people twice a week how to, how to cook grains and make salad dressings. And we showed them breakfasts and lunches and dinners. And those people who could eat in that delicious style, and it's delicious, uh, and take a walk every day, 
notice the same wonderful changes I did. I'd have them come in the office and step on the scale and get their blood pressure checked. And as the weeks went by, this marvelous downward progression of numbers started showing up on their chart. Their weight would go down by about two pounds a week if they were overweight. If they had high blood pressure, the blood pressure would come right on down. If they had high cholesterol, the cholesterol level would come right on down. If they were diabetic, their blood sugars would come right on down to normal. And very happily for me, the dosage of powerful medications I had these people on for their high blood pressure and their diabetes, I could lower them right on down and in fact many times get them off those medications completely including those for high blood pressure and diabetes, those pills that people are told they must take for the rest of their life. It's not that hard to get someone off high blood pressure pills. Just get all that fat and sodium, which is found in the meats and the dairy products, out of their diet, and most people's high blood pressure comes down to normal. But the best part is, they'd be walking out of the office and they say, you know, doctor, it's nice, my blood pressure's down, it's nice, my cholesterol. You know the best part? I haven't felt this good in years. I feel light and clean, I got energy, I sleep better, my breath is cleaner, I feel good. And that just warmed this old doctor's heart no end. I, medical school never really prepared me for people getting healthy. And uh, yet, uh, there they were, getting healthier right in front of my eyes. It, uh, it was really exciting to see. Now the problems that I mentioned with meat, too much fat, too much protein, and no fiber are common to all meats, whether it be red meat or poultry or fish, have no illusions, animal muscle is animal muscle, and they all have too much fat, too much protein, and no fiber. But nowadays, uh, animals are not raised in Old McDonald's barnyard out in the sunshine, so there's a whole new set of problems because the animals are raised on factory farms in conditions of tremendous overcrowding. These animals are fed grains that are sprayed with herbicides and pesticides. These are fat-soluble substances that concentrate in the flesh and the eggs and the milk of the animals. And the largest amount of pesticides and hybrid hydrocarbons coming into your diet are not those sprayed on fruits and vegetables. They come in the meats and the dairy products. And if you want to decrease the amount of pesticides you eat, consider cutting down the amount of animal products you eat. The animals in factory farm systems are fed tremendous amounts of antibiotics. When you feed antibiotics to animals, they grow bigger and they are less prone to infection. And half the antibiotics made in the United States, 30 million pounds of them a year, are fed to animals in their feed. Well, what happens when you feed a potent animal, uh, when you feed an animal a potent antibiotic like lincomycin, tetracycline, sulfonamides, ampicillin? What happens? Well, what you do is you kill off the antibiotic, uh, you kill off the bacteria in that animal's intestines that are susceptible to the antibiotic. What do you leave behind? The roughest, toughest, antibiotic-resistant bacteria going. And they have names like Salmonella, Shigella, Clostridia. You eat an underdone piece of chicken or burger with Salmonella bacteria on it, you're going to be very sorry. It rips up the lining of your intestine, gives you a bloody diarrhea. If you're an adult, it'll put you in the hospital with an intravenous going. And if you're a child, it'll dehydrate you and kill you. In, on this continent, over four million people every year get sick with salmonella food poisoning, largely from eating poultry and meat. The chicken carcasses are brought into the kitchen and slopped around all over the cutting board, and it contaminates the utensils in the kitchen. And, um, and uh, it's becoming a, a worrisome problem of major, major proportions. Antibiotics can lead to tainted meat. You bet they can, and more and more people are getting concerned about it. You don't have to give antibiotics to broccoli. Uh, you're going to see more and more headlines like this. Here's hundreds of people sick in Illinois from salmonella poisoning and milk. Uh, here are underdone burgers causing salmonella food poisoning. Here's a dreadful one. 400,000 hens and a million eggs poisoned with polychlorinated biphenols. This is an industrial chemical in uh, electrical transformers that, uh, when it's discarded from industry, winds up, excuse me, winds up in uh, the rivers and into the oceans and into the fish and accumulates in the fish flesh. Do you know that half the Canadian fish flesh is not eaten by people? Um, it's ground up and either made into fertilizer or added to animal feed. And here uh, was a tremendous amount of PCB contaminated fish flesh that was added to chicken feed and the chickens ate the PCBs and it wound up in, their, um, in the meat and in the eggs. People are getting concerned. They say, don't let unsafe food put our lives at risk for good reason. And these are episodes of contamination by animal-based foods. And so many of your friends who during the year get the flu, it isn't the flu, it's salmonella poisoning. The media has been fairly responsible in trying to educate us about the realities of the dangers of our high-fat diet. I'm very appreciative. It brings you to the same position that was reached by Gregorio Natividad, who is a meat inspector in Los Angeles, who worked there for 23 years. And he said, based on my experience in Los Angeles, my advice to the public is not to eat meat. This is a meat inspector watching it for 23 years. Maybe he knows something we should pay attention to. 
Here's another reason why you should consider changing our diet. Our kids are eating a lot of fat and it is hurting them. Our children in North America are fatter than ever before and their cholesterol levels are higher than ever before and we are seeing heart attacks in younger and younger people. Don't kid yourself, a heart attack is not something that falls out of a tree on you at age 50. It, this stuff builds up in your arteries from childhood. And every year on this continent, a thousand teenagers suffer strokes. A thousand teenagers a year suffer a stroke. John McDougall is one of them, by the way. Um, this, we are seeing fat-related disasters haunt our children. And researchers at Louisiana State University clearly say we should decrease the amount of fat we are feeding our kids. Here's USA Today um, telling, uh, announcing that study, recommending we lower the fat contents of our children's food. Uh, we are working actively to, um, to work in the schools to help get fat-free entrees onto the cafeteria line. High blood pressure, nasty disease, and it leads to strokes and heart attacks and kidney failure. Why do people get high blood pressure? Well, one way to view it is to consider the analogy of a garden hose. If you have a garden hose with a certain diameter and you have water flowing through it, there's going to be a certain pressure in that hose. What if you wanted to raise the pressure in the garden hose? Well, there's two ways to do it. One is to make the hose narrower. That will raise the pressure. The other thing to do is, is put more water through the hose, and that will raise the pressure. Well, that's exactly what happens in our arteries. As we eat the standard North American diet and that fat builds up in the arteries, the arteries become narrower, and so that raises the pressure. And when you eat sodium, as in table salt, sodium makes you retain water in order to, dil to dilute it out. And the more sodium you eat, the more water you pump around, and that's going to raise the pressure in your pipes. Guess where most by far, where most of the sodium is found in the North American diet? In meats and dairy products. Sodium is in the muscle of all animals. All meat has sodium. Chicken, fish, meat, it's in the muscle of the animal. And the second place that sodium is found is in cow's milk. That mother cow wants to give her baby calf lots of sodium because it's expanding its blood vessel as a growing calf should. And by far, meats and dairy products have more sodium than, than any other uh, substance in our diet. And if you really want to decrease your sodium content, decrease the meats and dairy products. And I tell you people, if you are being treated for high blood pressure and you are still eating cheese and eating chicken, you are kidding yourself. And no wonder the doctor is going to raise your amount of diuretics and Aldemet and all those other medications. If you really want to, to open up your arteries and decrease your sodium content, stop eating all that cheese and milk and, um, and animal products and you'll find your high blood pressure takes care of itself. On the, uh, and I want, I, want to, I don't want to be too um, uh, uh, too simplistic about it. There are other s severe causes of high blood pressure. It's a complicated disease. It's not the only cause of it. There are kidney reasons. There are other reasons. And you should work with your physician. Now, tell them you're changing your diet and you don't stop those medications by yourself. You work with them. But um, with, if you stay in communication with a physician, it is possible changing your diet to taper down those medications. And I found numerous times the doctor better taper down those medications because as people change their diet, reduce the fat and salt, the potent medications we have them on are become too strong and people start passing out when they stand up. It's important that the doctor tapers down the medication. So tell him what, or her that you're reducing your sodium content and work with them. You'll often be able to get off your medications or at least substantially reduce them. Premenstrual syndrome, PMS, whoever thought that had anything to do with diet? Certainly does. When a woman eats animal fats, again, that substance prostaglandin 2 is released in her body. And prostaglandin 2 makes the uterus constrict, it makes her retain fluid, it makes her get irritable. Premenstrual syndrome. I can't tell you how many women in my practice, when they've eliminated the meats and dairy products for other reasons, for blood pressure reasons or obesity reasons, a few months later, they're walking out of the office and say, you know something, by the way, my PMS went away. My last three periods haven't bothered me at all. Isn't that amazing, doctor? No, it's not amazing. The lady stopped running fat through her bloodstream and changed her prostaglandin balance, and her body's a lot happier. These conditions that I'm telling you improve with a, with a vegetarian diet. It's, I'm not trying to say it's a panacea. I think the opposite situation exists. Why do we have all these diseases? I think it's analogous to pulling into a gasoline station with your car, and instead of pulling up to the gas tank and putting a gas pump and putting gasoline in your car, you pull up to the diesel pump and you put diesel fuel in your tank, which is kerosene. Now, kerosene is too oily. And what happens? You drive away and there's black smoke coming out the tailpipe and there's a, a crud building up on the uh, spark plugs and the engine runs rough and it stops. And you get towed back into the garage and the mechanic asks you, what are you burning in for fuel? And you say, why, kerosene. And he says, well, I have an idea. Why don't you try gasoline? 
and you put gasoline in the car, oh, works great. Oh, the black smoke disappears, the engine hums along, and you think about the mechanic and say, oh, he's so smart. He's not so smart, he just told you to put the proper fuel in the engine and it'll run fine. Similarly with us, animal fats are too oily, they're too greasy, they stick to us, they clog us up. Your body cells burn carbohydrates. Your Krebs cycle enzymes burn carbohydrates. We burn sugars and starches. That's what you want to run your body on, not animal fats. Which brings us around to the Cebu Lions of the Japanese Professional Baseball League. More and more world-class athletes are realizing that our body cells burn sugars and starches, not fats. And if you are an athlete about to run a marathon or play tennis or basketball, it is just irrational to sit down to a big T-bone steak and load up on fat and protein. That's exactly what you don't want. You want carbohydrates. And training tables around the world are springing up with fruits and pastas before a match, and that's really what athletes should be eating. Cebu Lions finished in last place in their league in 1981. Their coach put them on a vegetarian diet. The next year they came up, beat everybody in the league, and took the league championship two years in a row. There are now vegetarian weightlifters, and uh, Andres Cowling, Mr. Universe down in California, is a, a, weight, is a uh, vegetarian. James Donaldson, the big seven foot three in center of the Dallas Mavericks, is a vegetarian. Uh, there's marathon uh, runners that are vegetarians, uh, cyclists, tennis players. You, s you don't have to eat a bull to be as strong as one, that's, that's for sure. We need a higher viewing of nutrition altogether. The one that we've been given simply isn't working very well. We need a higher viewing. What is the higher viewing? Well, let's talk about the one that isn't working very well. If you learn nutrition like I did, you learned it off this silly poster that hangs in grammar school walls all over this country, and it essentially says that food comes in four groups and four groups only. It comes in the milk group, in the meat group, in the fruit and vegetable group, and the grain group. And you better have some of every group every day, or you risk becoming sick, malnourished, or dead. <laughs> Subtle message, but it's what the kids are given. It's what I grew up with. Maybe it's what you grew up with. People, let's get real about the basic four food group scheme. It was not, repeat not, handed down to Moses on Mount Sinai with the Ten Commandments carved in stone. The basic four food group scheme was invented by the United States Department of Agriculture in 1956 to promote the sale of meat and dairy products. What do you really need to run your human body? Nutrition 101, what do you really need? You need five things. It has nothing to do with cheeseburgers and milkshakes. The human body has no nutritional requirement for animal flesh, none. And it functions superbly on a balanced, varied diet of plant-based foods. Five things you require. Protein, water, vitamins, minerals, and energy. That's what you require. You need a little bit of protein, 30 grams a day. It abounds in grains and legumes and fruits and vegetables. It's no problem getting enough protein. You need two quarts of water every day. That's found in the water you drink, the juices you drink, the fruit and vegetables that you eat. That's no problem. You need vitamins and minerals. They are found in green and yellow vegetables. Have a nice salad every day, a couple of carrots. You get all the vitamins that you need and all the minerals. We'll talk about vitamin B12 in a minute. Even that comes from plant-based foods. And you need energy to fire your muscles and make your nerves work. But energy is found in the sugars and starches that are found in fruits and vegetables and starches. And oils um, that are found in whole grains and avocados and vegetable oils. There's plenty of energy available. That's all you need. Protein, water, vitamins, minerals, and energy, and a little bit of fiber to keep the intestines working normally, but that's an automatic if you're eating whole grains and fruits and vegetables. That's all you need to run your human body, and all of these are found in plant-based foods. You never have to eat an animal if you don't want to. But where are you going to get your protein? Qu perennial question posed to vegetarians. The same place that elephants and buffaloes and giraffes get their protein, you get out of plant-based food. Grains are loaded with protein. In your diet every day, you need 5% of your calories as protein. Grains are 10% protein. So all the breads that you eat, the, the dinner grains, rice and barley and millet, lots of protein. The pastas that are made from whole grains, lots of protein. Legumes, anything that grows in a pot is a legume. Be beans, peas, chickpeas, lentils, 25% protein, loaded with protein. Green vegetables, no one ever told me broccoli has lots of protein. It sure does, 15% protein in green vegetables. Nuts are a nice source of protein. People say, oh, I want to eat nuts, makes you fat. Not if you're not running butter fat and cheese and egg yolks through your bloodstream. Have a handful of almonds. It's not going to hurt you, and you can use the calcium and the protein for good advantage. Sprouts are a nice source of protein. So are seeds, sunflower seeds, sesame seeds, pumpkin seeds. Lots of protein available. You cannot consume a calorically adequate 2,000 calorie diet made up of grains and legumes and green vegetables, nuts, sprouts, and seeds without guaranteeing yourself 50 grams of high-grade protein. It's in, the, it's in the plant foods. 
and you don't have to combine grains with legumes. That whole wise tale that, that they're incomplete proteins is a myth. Uh, all plant proteins are complete in and of themselves. Grains are complete proteins, beans are complete protein, greens, well, they're all complete. If you want to combine them, that's nice, but have no protein neurosis that if you don't put <laughs> tofu spread in your whole wheat bread, that is a waste of time. They're all complete proteins all by themselves. And protein from plant foods do not yank the calcium out of your body the way protein from animal foods do. Where are we going to get your calcium? If you're not drinking milk, get your calcium from the same place cows get their calcium. I mean, think about it. Cows don't drink milk. <laughs> Where do they get the calcium? They get it from green plants. All green plants have calcium in it, and all the broccoli and collards and kale that you eat. Nuts have calcium, seeds, grains. Calcium's in all plant foods. It's easy to get enough calcium, and again, the important thing is that if you're not eating all this concentrated protein in the chicken and the fish, you'll hold on to your calcium and uh, you will avoid osteoporosis. By the way, the ethnic group with the worst osteoporosis on the planet are the Eskimos. We eat all that fish, they wind up urinating out the calcium. They dug up an Eskimo skeleton of a lady who died 500 years ago in the ice. She had terrible osteoporosis. So what in the world to eat? Good heavens, he's taken fish away from us and cheese away from us. What is there left to eat? Well, I really think we ought to be basing our diet on grains. Here is a cross-section of a kernel of wheat, but all grains, barley, oats, millet, rye, they're all basically built the same way. Here is the new young wheat plant, and this is the germ, and it's rich in protein and vitamins and minerals and oils, and it's a great source of protein and minerals for us. Here is the starch, the carbohydrate that fuels the little plant. It fuels us just beautifully as well. And all this is wrapped in a layer of bran, the fiber, and it uh, is an excellent package of, of nutrition for us. Now, who eats grains, you must say? We're, you know, we're not horses. Who eats grains? <laughs> Well, we do. Uh, all the whole grain bread that you're eating has lots of nice, um, nice protein and fiber in it. And you can have four slices of this a day. You will not get fat. It's just carbohydrates and water and fiber, and you'll either burn it or pass it out. Uh, I hope nobody is eating white Kleenex bread anymore. If you're going to be eating whole grain bread, get the benefits of all the bran and the uh, protein and the fiber as well. Cereals, nice source of whole grain goodness, and there's lots of good whole grain uh, cereals available in the supermarket these days. Uh, this material is called tofu yogurt. I'll tell you about tofu yogurt in a minute. Uh, you can cook grains up and add a, a nut butter, like sesame seed butter, and turn it into a nice grain loaf, and it takes the place of, uh, of meatloaf, and you serve it with gravies and sauces. You can take this same grain mixture and mix it up into burger patties and make grain burgers, and it takes the place of hamburgers, and you, set it, you, you serve it on a bun with lettuce and tomatoes and sprouts. One nice thing to do is one morning in your kitchen, uh, make up about 50 of these, wrap them in wax paper, and put them in your freezer. Now you got a whole freezer full of burgers. Uh, you come time for lunch, whip out a couple, put them in the toaster oven, heat them up, and you got an instant lunch. You don't have to slave over a vegetarian banquet every time. Use your freezer. These foods last a long time. Pastas are a nice source of grain goodness. There's lots of whole grain pastas, corn pastas, oat pastas available these days. Grains can be added to soups. You have vegetable rice soup, bean and barley soup, wonderful place to get grain goodness into your, um, into your uh, diet. And a big bowl of this kind of soup and a hunk of dark bread makes a wonderful, nutritious lunch with no cholesterol. Corn is a nice grain, enjoy it often. Rice is a nice grain, it uh, fuels half the people on the planet tonight. Legumes, wonderful source of protein. Uh, three tablespoons of this bean salad will give you as much protein as a chicken dinner, but it won't yank calcium out of your bones the way chicken flesh does. The bean family is huge. Uh, lima beans, zuki beans, navy beans, great northern beans, lots of beans. People say, well, I want to eat beans because they give me gas. <laughs> um, the way around that, by the way, is to realize that most of the gas problem comes from a sugar on the surface of the bean called hemicellulose. And hemicellulose is soluble in water. So, if you're going to be making bean soup or bean chili, the night before, take the beans, put them in a pot covered with water, and let them soak overnight. The next morning, spill off the soaking water, rinse the beans a couple times, and you'll get rid of most of that hemicellulose and stay a lot more socially acceptable to your friends. <laughs> Lentils, nice source of uh, protein. Soak them, season them, enjoy them. Probably the legume protein that's consumed most by vegetarians is soy protein in the form of tofu. Tofu is found at all supermarkets these days. Uh, you buy it with the, uh, uh, it's dated, um, like milk, and you buy the tofu with the date furthest in the future, so it's the freshest tofu. Take it home, open the package, spill off the soaking water, take the block of tofu, put it in a bowl, cover it with water, and you store it in your fridge under water. Every morning, just change the tofu water, and it'll keep for a while, but it shouldn't keep that long in your fridge. You ought to use it. Now, some people say, I tried tofu once, yuck, it's bland and yucky, it doesn't taste good. Well, that's because tofu is a raw ingredient. Pastry flour doesn't taste great either until you do something with it. You've got to make it into cookies and cakes. Same thing with tofu. 
What do you do with it? Well, lots of things. It's a great meat substitute. It's a great transition food, even though it's a processed food. You can cube it up and put it in your stir-fried vegetables, and it takes the place of meat. We've got all the protein here. It's here's soy protein and then the tofu, uh, green vegetable protein in the broccoli, nut protein in the walnuts. There are lots of protein. Serve this over rice and, or rice and noodles, and uh, you'll get easily the protein that you would out of a meat meal, but without the calcium losing effect of all that animal protein. Uh, tofu can be cubed up and added to salads. It takes up the place of, uh, it takes up the, the uh, salad dressing and um, enhances the flavor of the salad. You can scramble tofu. You can mash it up and add a yellow spice called turmeric and some sesame seed butter and you put it in your skillet and it turns into a beautiful scrambled egg substitute that can be served over toast. You can mash up tofu and brown it and turn it into spaghetti and tofu balls. You can make tofu cream pie, tofu cheesecake. This is not a diet of deprivation, let me tell you, by a long shot. This slide is to remind me to tell you that you should not eat all your foods all processed. The more you cook food, the deader it gets. You heat up food and it starts uh, losing vitamin contents, the, the proteins coagulate, the fats denature. Um, cooking food devitalizes it. Eat as much of your diet as you can, raw and fresh, or lightly steamed vegetables. Um, my diet now is about 60-40 raw, 70-30 raw around there. I can't do a whole raw diet right now, and it's not time for me to do that. When I try to do that, I lose weight and start dreaming about potatoes and spaghetti, and so I go back and eat cooked foods. But I, when I eat all cooked foods, I'm loggy and heavy, and um, that doesn't feel good either. So think about moving your diet more towards uncooked foods. Vegetables, again, should be lightly steamed or just a quick stir-fry and a walk and out. Don't deep fry anything. Keep that food as fresh and vital as you can. I'm here to help dispel illusions. This is the kind of attitude we can no longer afford. We gotta stop kidding ourselves about what we are doing on this planet because our dietary and lifestyles are ripping this planet up. Victor Hugo said, no army is as powerful as an idea whose time has come. We've got to start living reverently on this planet. We've got to start being gentle with the life support systems upon which we all depend, including the waters and the rivers and the trees and the animals and the earth itself. And changing our diet along with, eliminate, with uh, controlling our population and getting clean energy supplies, controlling our diet is absolutely key. You have that power every time you're in the supermarket or the restaurant. People say, think globally, act locally. There's nothing more local than your dinner plate. And you have the power to make yourself healthier and the planet. The, if I had to summarize this lecture in a single sentence, it's this. The single most effective thing anybody can do in order to make themselves personally healthier and make this ecosystem more stable and life-preserving is to reduce or eliminate the animal flesh in your diet. It is the single most effective thing that you can do. If we will do that, we will not only ensure a better future for us all, but we will redefine the relationship we have with every creature on this planet.